19 years ago this morning, I was at work listening to WDEV when a report came over the radio that a plane had hit one of the Twin Towers in New York City. I stopped what I was doing and turned on the TV to get an update. I watched as another plane flew into the second tower, and it soon became clear that our nation was under attack. There were then reports from Virginia that a third plane had hit the Pentagon, and then a fourth went down in Pennsylvania. I watched as the towers came down and sat in disbelief, seeing the images of smoke rising from New York City. We all watched in real time as the world was changed forever. Like every American who lived through September 11, 2001, I remember everything about that day. The shock of what was unfolding right before our eyes. We remember the pain we felt for those we lost, those who were missing, and those they left behind. We remember the bravery of first responders who ran towards danger in order to help others, and the valor of service members like our own Vermont National Guard F-16 pilots and team members who stood ready to protect American citizens from future attacks. But today, in the face of a once-in-a-century crisis that has taken the lives of almost 200,000 Americans, it's also important to remember the determination and resolve we found in those days, weeks, and months following September 11th because our country desperately needs to find that unity again. We need to harness the same care and compassion that allowed us to move forward then in order to get us through the deadly emergency we face today. 19 years ago, again, we saw firsthand that when we work towards a common purpose, that as Americans, we can do almost anything. As we seek answers, to how we get through those unprecedented times, we need to look no further than to the humanity and courage that got us through those events we're remembering today. And it's so important for us to be united because the fact is, this is going to be with us until there's a safe vaccine in place and it's been widely distributed. At that point, we should be able to manage this just like we do the flu rather than with the drastic steps we've had to take over the last six months. We know this is going to take some time. And while our numbers have been low in Vermont, the measures in place have helped keep it that way. So again, it probably comes as no surprise that I'll be extending the state of emergency to October 15th. As I've said, this is the vehicle that allows us to manage and continue to suppress this virus and make sure supports for workers and families remain available. Things like unemployment benefits and the eviction moratorium. It's important to realize just how fortunate we are here in Vermont. Because of the work and sacrifice of all of you, we've been able to methodically open up the economy since late April, with most sectors open today in some capacity. And more importantly, We've kept them open to date. While many child care centers remained open throughout the pandemic, we opened the rest in June. And this week, we were able to see excited kids get on buses so they could physically go to school, see their friends, and learn from the teachers they desperately missed seeing in person last spring. Our ability to continuously move forward and not have to take steps back has been incredible, especially when you look around the country because many states cannot say the same thing. Vermonters should be proud. You've stepped up, put on a mask, been smart about keeping your distance and limited the number of people you connect with. You've found ways to work from home. You've staycationed instead of vacationed. And importantly, you pulled in the same direction to protect our neighbors and show how much you care about each other. 
I know this hasn't been easy. I know the thought of doing this for another month and likely a few more is disappointing. But if we continue down this path, if our numbers remain good once we get through school reopening and college return, we'll continue to open that spigot a bit more. But as we've done from the very start, it will be based on the data and science. Rest assured, we'll get through this. I know we will. And with Vermont ingenuity and perseverance, I believe we'll be stronger as a result. This pandemic has meant doing things differently. And to me, it's been a pathway to innovate and improve. We're seeing entrepreneurs find new opportunities and businesses finding creative ways to serve customers that will be used long after the pandemic. And we're seeing leaders in communities across the state think about how we do, can do things better so we can do more with less. I truly believe we'll be able to harness this creativity for a stronger, more versatile economy, a better, more equitable education for our kids from cradle to career, better systems to serve our neighbors in need, and stronger communities that are already attracting more people to the state, which we know we desperately need here in Vermont. This won't be easy. And like our response on the health side, it will take hard work, creativity, some difficult decisions, and most importantly, all of us pulling in the same direction, united around a shared goal to see Vermont through this once in a century crisis. Thank you all for what you're doing to help each other through this pandemic. And with that, I'll now turn it over to Commissioner Pichuk for this week's modeling update. Uh, thank you, Governor, and good morning, everyone. Uh, this morning, we will uh, talk at first about some national uh, and Vermont-based trends that we're seeing in the data, and then turn specifically to Vermont data, uh, some an updated forecast, uh, then our updated uh, restart metrics. Uh, we'll turn then to a higher education update, uh, then close with a regional uh, and travel map update as well. Uh, and for those uh, viewing at home, just a reminder that our presentation uh, is available at dfr.vermont.gov for anyone uh, who would like to follow along. So turning to our first slide, uh, we see a map of the U.S. and new cases over the past 14 days. Certainly a few trends stand out here. First, uh, there are still quite a few cases in the United States. We've been averaging about 36,000 cases a day over the past week, uh, but that is an improvement um, from uh, just a month to two months ago. So marked improvement on cases, but still cases popping up around the country. You see maybe a little less cases in the South and the West, but certainly more cases in the Dakotas, in Iowa, uh, in parts of the Midwest as well. Uh, but most importantly uh, for us here in Vermont, you see that Vermont and the Northeast continue to have very low disease prevalence uh, just in the past 14 days. Vermont, for those 14 days, continues to have the lowest um, prevalence of the virus in the country. Uh, we continue to have the lowest positivity rate for the last seven days, and we have the lowest uh, prevalence rate from the start of the pandemic as well. So certainly it's always good uh, to have low cases, but um, particularly good to be hitting this low case period uh, when K through 12 is restarting and higher education is restarting. For this week, you see that we had uh, 30 new cases. So that is an improvement from the uh, 45 that uh, were revised down from 42 last week. So both of those factors, the fact that a few cases ended up not being cases and removed from the list, and the fact that cases have been improved this week, uh, we see on the next slide that our forecast um, does trend more favorably uh, than it did last week. So this forecast includes uh, everything that we talked about last week. It includes our uh, higher education cases, the cases that we've seen over the last three weeks. It includes um, a forecast and a projection about mobility when uh, K through 12 reopens. So parents uh, being more mobile, returning to work potentially, running more errands uh, and things of that nature. And then it includes our most recent case trends as well. And like I said, uh, the, the forecast for the next six weeks is rather mild. Uh, pretty slight increase in cases. Uh, we frequently beat our forecasts and projections, however, 
um, and we'll uh, continue to watch this closely. But certainly, uh, those forecasted cases are nothing uh, that the health department cannot handle in terms of their contact tracing capacity uh, and testing. So that gives us continued hope uh, as we reopen K through 12. Turning to our four restart metrics, um, again, these are all trending very favorably. Uh, first, with syndromic surveillance, we can see from the chart that uh, those reporting to the emergency room with COVID-like illness remains very low. Uh, we'll continue to watch this metric uh, and those reporting flu-like illness as the flu becomes more prevalent uh, in the country in the Northeast. But for now, these numbers remain very low and well below uh, our guardrail. Similarly, on the uh, growth metric, you can see that we had really low sustained growth for the last three or four months and um, nothing that gives us any pause for concern uh, there. Uh, next is the, is the uh, positivity rate. Again, lowest positivity rate in the country the last seven days. We've had extraordinarily low positivity rate through the entire restart. And as the governor said, that's quite impressive when you consider all of the different uh, parts of our society and our economy that we have uh, opened up over the last four or five months and have remained open uh, during that period of time as well. Turning to our ICU capacity, we continue to uh, be below our buffer. Um, but even if we were close to or above our buffer, because our other indicators are trending so favorably, uh, not a concern at this time. Only a single individual is in the hospital at this moment, and no one is in the ICU for COVID-related illness. So uh, again, very favorable when uh, considering hospital resource usage as well. Turning to the uh, higher education update, more good news um, came in this week from our uh, higher ed institutions. You can see that uh, we did another 15,000 tests here in Vermont. Um, and out of those 15,000 tests, another five uh, positives were reported. So a really, really slight uh, positivity rate. Uh, good to see that uh, these numbers here would indicate, you know, continued ongoing testing and then those that were getting their day seven tests as well. So we're now really through that restart period and on to that monitoring period. But really um, good to see these results uh, as we continue on through the semester. When you look at the total numbers, that's over 42,000 tests that have been administered since the college restart and uh, 38 positives for a very low 0.09% positivity rate. So again, trending very favorably there. When we look at um, the other Northern New England states, we look at New Hampshire and Maine and their college uh, higher ed restarts, you can see that they also have been uh, having success in the reopening. Uh, this uh, data that we have here is from the, those colleges and universities that have provided their COVID data publicly. So it's not exhaustive for New Hampshire and for Maine, but you can see for New Hampshire and Maine, it's a good representation. Uh, 70,000 tests in New Hampshire, 110 positives, just under 40,000 tests in Maine uh, with 42 positives. So uh, positivity rates a little higher than Vermont, but all extremely low and really reinforces that message that you know, when you have uh, individuals coming from a low prevalence community uh, and you have good policies in place that you can successfully reopen these institutions and we'll have to continue to keep a close eye on them as the semester unfolds, certainly. Uh, turning to our regional data, we did see uh, a, a smoothing out of cases uh, week over week. Uh, cases declined uh, just not over 2% this week, which was uh, certainly uh, good to see the first time cases have slowed uh, in the last three weeks as well. So we'll keep a close eye on these uh, regional trends as uh, college restart um, continues in many places across the region as uh, reactions from Labor Day will come in over the next few weeks as well. Turning now to the updated uh, travel map, uh, you'll see that we have uh, some improvement in parts of the region. Uh, in total, 5.5 uh, million individuals can now come to Vermont without a quarantine that's up from 5.2 million last week, so an additional 300,000 uh, individuals. And when you look at the map, you can see that there was improvement in New England and parts of Maine, the Cape uh, turned back to green uh, and other parts of New York kind of swapped back and forth from green to yellow. Uh, but generally, you know, some good signs here uh, in New England. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Rich Snyder, who is going to join us by video uh, for some more information about the higher education restart. Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, good morning, Governor. Um, let me just check to make sure that the people in the conference room can, in the auditorium can hear me. We can hear you just fine. Thank you very much for coming on, Rich. Hi, Governor. I'm talking to you from uh, Lesta. 
Vermont today, and uh, it is beautiful here every day. So uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, I'm delighted to brief you on where we stand for higher education, and this is a whole report, uh, our private college, our state college system, and uh, UVM. So this, we're all standing together on this, and um, the governor tasked us, and we accepted that challenge, to have the uh, safest place in America to go to college. And that is our uh, goal, and that is our mission. And uh, we have written the plan for executing that plan. Now, every leader, whether it's a CEO or military general or admiral, knows that the best part of planning is doing actual planning. Now, when you make first contact with the enemy, something's going to change because the enemy is not quite like you thought it was going to be, or the enemy changes over time, or the it changes over time, and certainly the virus going to change over time as well and it is really our enemy i want to credit susan steely the avic executive director who went for break march and april read every plan that she could find about opening schools and colleges and state plans to dr levine and his team who told us what we had to make sure we could get them here and keep them here safely and not infected and then to Ted Brady, who is uh, with our Agency of uh, Commerce and Economic Development, for taking all the writings that Susan and I had done and made sense out of those writings and published the guidelines that we are still following today. It's been a team effort from the beginning, but we are really through phase one of the plan and into phase two. And the people on the ground now, the college presidents and the student leaders and the faculty and staff, that are making this a huge success. For your listeners, there are three major phases or themes to this plan. The first one was to get the fear uninfected. The second phase is to keep them uninfected. And the third phase is when they do get infected, which is gonna happen, can we identify them and help them get better, but also reduce the risk to infection on our campus. We are through phase one. And Governor, I'm delighted to report, and as you heard uh, Mike just report, uh, we are doing your mission. That is, we are the safest college place to go to school in America, and also the safest place for our communities that are hosting colleges in America. And that is a great thing uh, that we're through that first phase. All the schools have really started now. They've been up and running. Everybody's got day seven tests in. We had some students that were ill that were infected, we identified them, we took care of them, we did unbelievable contact tracing, that is Dr. Levine did, in fact, I got a great note from Pat Moulton at BTC the other day who said they were unbelievable, uh, professional, calming influence on her campus because they had one positive. And uh, the dean just wrote me and said, uh, boy, when they first found out, they freaked out, but they picked the plan, executed the plan, and by the time the day was over, they knew they could do this, and they did do it. And by the way, there is no student at college in Vermont right now that's still in quarantine or isolation. They all have been healed, they are all not infectious, and they are back studying and back with their friends. So phase one is done, and part of phase three, which was, okay, somebody does get sick, can we take care of them? We have a couple campuses now who have actually exercised that part of the plan and have been very successful at it. And so we know that we can do that. The real challenge now for all of us is phase two, to keep them uninfected. And that is, is everyone's everyone's job. So I I do wanna let all your listeners know and all of you that all of our campuses have done a huge lift since March when we sent all of our students home. But over the summer, there was great creativity among our faculty, staff, and students about messaging the students that were returning and the new ones that were coming about what the new college experience was going to be like. We have changed all of our dining. And by the way, all these changes are expensive. We have changed all of our dining. There is no travel from university employees uh, or, or staff uh, university money. And if you do have essential travel and you do have to travel, um, you're going to be following the quarantine rules. So if you go to a place that needs quarantine, you will come back to Vermont and you will quarantine. Uh, there's no large gatherings. And by the way, this is going to hurt, unfortunately, our economy somewhat, but there's no parents' weekends anywhere. There's no homecomings. 
And by the way, homecomings is when most of our colleges raise a lot of their funds, gift funds, from their alumni who come back. It's going to be very hurtful, and it's going to hurt our lodging industry and places like that. There's no large symposiums. We're doing a lot of this online. And of course, sports, uh, we're not going to be playing uh, other teams. We are going to be practicing on our campuses, but uh, we're not going to be having athletic competition. We've reduced the size of our classes. We've reduced the number of people in our dormitories, and we've had everyone sign a health contract. We've had a lot of, I think, success because of the health contract. I got a note from a student at Bennington that I just want to read a portion of. It says, I'm following the health and safety guidelines because I want to stick it full. I don't have another place to go. And that's the case for so many of us students who are international or who are first generation, low income and working class. Being in school is so much more for us than just being in school is security. It's about having a safe place, having a room, and having food. It's a privilege to be here and to be in person, and that's not something I or my friends want to risk in any way. They really want to be here. The freshmen that we have today know what it was like to lose their senior year of high school, their proms, their graduation, and not want that to happen. There's a saying at Norwich right now, and I, I was the old president at Norwich, that wear your mask so I can wear my uniform. And by the way, there is a college student that wants to go home. They want to be with their friends, they want to be with their faculty members, they want to have a college experience. So the freshmen are very careful right now. They don't want to relive their senior year. And the upper upperclassmen that we have back in our campuses, they don't want to go home again like they had to in March. So they've lived it. They know what it's like. So they're generally following the rules. Are we going to be perfect? Absolutely not. Will every kid be perfect? No. You guys don't send us perfect students, right? And many of you that are listening have raised teenagers, so you know what I'm talking about. But in the main, they are in unbelievably compliant and actually much better than I had ever hoped for. Everyone is committed to keeping our politics safe and our community safe. I got a note from uh, Lori Patton, who was out in the town walking around visiting students that were not living on campus but were living off campus. She came across some that were on the porch, and she talked with them, and they said, yeah, we, we love being at school. We're not coming to stop them. The next day, she gets a note from them and a bunch of cookies on a plate, I guess, saying, thanks for coming to and we're not going to let you down. So those are... Those are the kind of things that are happening on our campus. We are entering this phase, though, of keeping healthy, keeping their health contracts honored. That's why Mr. Pichak gave you the data earlier, um, and we are going to be reporting data about how many COVID cases that we might have, uh, what is the number of students that are being disciplined, and how many are actually going to be leaving our campus because they can't live by our standards. And so far, uh, we've had nine students at our campus that's across Vermont. I'm not prepared and I'm not gonna speak about individual cases, but that's just an indication. We have over 40 thousand students on our campuses right now. And uh, I am very proud of them. I'm proud of their administrations and faculty and staff who are getting this happen. And Governor, uh, so far so good on your mission. Uh, I'm not going to declare mission but we get to Thanksgiving and they all go home. But we do have victory on phase one of getting them here safely, a partial victory on three of how do we take care of them if they get infected. We don't have to do that now. And I want to commend Dean and his team for helping us. So Governor, that completes my report for now. Well, thank you very much. Uh, great news, Rich, um, and I appreciate your leadership in this in endeavor. Uh, hopefully you'll be able, able to stay on the line in case there's any questions for you uh, later on. Yes, but this, but yes, this, sir. thank you. At this point, I'd like to uh, ask Dr. Levine to come up and give us a health uh, update. <clears throat> thank you, and uh, Rich spent a lot of his time in his own entertaining way 
thanking a lot of us, but we must thank him as well for all of the hard work that he put into this project and his undying and unflagging commitment to making the college restart successful. Don't have a lot to add to what uh, Commissioner Pichek has presented already in terms of the health update. You've heard about the quite low numbers of new cases that we've been experiencing in the last week or so. We are obviously going to be looking with uh, great attention at the impact of Labor Day, college restart, and school restart over the next seven to ten day period. I'm happy to report that we have probably closed out and resolved more outbreaks than we have taken on. Uh, there are only literally a handful of outbreaks that we're following. And I remind you that an outbreak may only be two cases or three cases. Uh, it's not a uh, hundred cases. And these are all very small. Um, I'd like to pick up on something that's in the news a lot of, uh, lately, though, which is vaccination. And um, while we all look forward to hopefully enjoying the benefits of a safe and effective vaccine, we clearly hear the fears that are expressed by many that political pressure is being applied to rush approval of a vaccine before it's been properly tested. I want to make it quite clear that the Vermont Health Department is keeping a close watch on the vaccine development process to be sure that we can trust that politics do not trump science and that when a safe and effective vaccine is available, we'll be ready to deliver it to Vermonters quickly and equitably. Even though we don't yet know when that exact day will come, we're doing everything in our power to plan ahead. <clears throat> As I've said at previous press conferences, we've convened a COVID-19 vaccine planning group and work is well underway to make sure that all the systems and processes are in place to do so. This unprecedented global pandemic has all eyes focused on finding a vaccine as quickly as possible. But the tremendous pressure to rapidly develop a vaccine must not outweigh the importance of its efficacy and safety. We stand together with other health departments across the country, as well as the National Association of Immunization Managers, in our assistance that any vaccine made available to the public must meet all of the Food and Drug Administration safety standards and be recommended by ASIP, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, which is an independent national advisory committee that sets policy on lots of vaccines that we use routinely. Recent developments involve uh, a letter that was publicized um, by nine pharmaceutical companies uh, it was really a pledge to make sure that they adhere to all of the usual kinds of standards that they would be adhering to in any environment. A phone call that members of our department engaged in yesterday with FDA, CDC, and the Surgeon General reaffirming their commitment to a process that respected science integrity and will be trustworthy. And in addition, there was an opinion column published in USA Today where eight top regulators at the FDA promised to uphold the scientific integrity of their work and defend the agency's independence. All good news. All newly developed vaccines must be continually monitored for safety and efficacy. A comprehensive system is in place and it must be fully utilized to ensure the safety of any COVID-19 vaccine. And as we mentioned the other day, AstraZeneca has temporarily paused work on its vaccine development due to an adverse event in one of the uh, volunteers enrolled in that study, just to determine if that event is in any way related to the vaccine or not. That is business as usual in the way these trials are conducted, and we should applaud that. Until the vaccine's available, We'll be working to make sure Vermont is ready. I, along with our immunization and infectious disease experts, will continue to watch closely as things develop and will share important new updates 
as we get new information. We stand with science. And as we wait for the vaccine, we must keep up our preventive practices, especially so we come into the fall and the winter and flu season. Keep those masks on, keep a six foot distance, avoid crowded spaces, wash your hands a lot, and stay home and away from others when you're ill. These basic infection control practices that help prevent the spread of the coronavirus may also help us with regard to the flu season. If Australia's experience during their recently completed flu season can be instructive to us in the Northern Hemisphere, simple measures such as these might well diminish the amount of morbidity and mortality we might see from the flu this fall and winter in our state and in our country. And of course, I must always say that for anyone aged six months or older, get your flu shot. The flu vaccine is beginning to be available now in your doctor's office, in pharmacies across the state, and soon in other locales that we're working with the healthcare system on. Getting the flu and COVID-19 at the same time or in succession could be devastating, certainly won't be fun. And before I close, feeling like a proud father, I must humbly share with all Vermonters the news that yesterday, once again, the CDC acknowledged Vermont's contact tracing efforts are the best in the nation. I'll turn it back to the governor now. Thank you, Dr. Levine. And with that, we'll open up to questions. All right, uh, thank you, Governor. So I just had a clarifying question. So um, no students in quarantine right now. Is that just at UVM or statewide? Dr. Levine? Yeah, I think Rich is still on the phone, but I believe that, uh, yes, that is statewide yeah. across all campuses. Uh, Rich, did you hear the question? I did, sir, and, and I agree with Dr. Levine. We have no one in quarantine right now. Everyone has recovered and back with their classes. All right. And I, um, what percentage uh, do you know, or maybe ballpark, what percentage of students are coming from hot spot areas? Um, and then I guess kind of a follow up to that, uh, why, I guess, are, are we seeing such a low positivity rate among students all throughout New England, even as, you know, bigger schools? people are coming from the south, from the west, from, from all over. Um, I'll answer part of that. I believe um, the, the majority of the students are coming from the northeast. Um, but there are some coming from other areas. And, and I think some of the measures that were put into place uh, by the restart team for, for the colleges and universities uh, made sure they were tested uh, either before they came here or quarantined before they came here or when, once they got here were tested uh, to be sure uh, that we kept it that way. So I give a lot of credit uh, to that team uh, that put forth the guidance and, uh, and protected Vermont in the, in the way that they did. Rich, uh, did you hear that question? Yes, sir, I did, and your answer is exactly right. And we credit Dr. Levine and his team for making sure we started correctly. Um, for, and also, by the way, I'll add that we could only bring in the same number of students that we could test on day zero. And so many of the schools have to phase in the start of their operation. So um, Norwich, for example, brought in 500 students from hotspots. Normally, they bring in a total of about 850. And um, those were all quarantinable students, so they all came together. We tested them on day zero, but we had very low rates of infection because we required the students to quarantine for 14 days before they came. And uh, we can thank Dr. Levine and his team for requiring that in the guidelines. And uh, Governor, you also mentioned that uh, we're, we're about two weeks in since some of the students have come back. When, if we continue to see this, this data be low, when will we see the next uh, hospitality state of turn? Yeah, again, uh, you know, I wanted to give it a couple of weeks. Um, I think uh, if things continue the way they are, uh, we'll be announcing some, uh, some opening of the spigot. Uh, uh, possibly next week, the end of next week. But again, it, it all is, uh, uh, is reliant on the data and the science, uh, making sure that it's safe to do so. And then last question, um, 
students going home, I know it's kind of a ways away, but for Thanksgiving break, coming back, they're yeah. going to have to do the same song yeah, again. I, I mean, how, how do you see that going? Or you know, do you think Again, I'll rely on... Uh, on uh, Dr. Schneider uh, to uh, to talk about that, but uh, you know we'll have to start it all over again. We'll have to be just as vigilant as we were uh, this go around uh, when they come back, uh, giving that long uh, that time period, not having them come back and forth, uh, was part of the plan, which I think is uh, was masterfully done uh, because without that they'd be coming back and forth and possibly uh, infecting uh, more Vermonters or transmitting the disease back and forth which is what we don't want them to do. But I, but I would believe uh, when they come back in, in January uh, that they would have to take the same steps, the same uh, proper guidelines uh, to be sure that it's uh, effective, as, as safely effective as it was in this, uh, in this first phase. Um, Rich, uh, anything to offer on that? No, sir, Governor, you're right on target. Um, we are planning to do the same thing again. Now, a lot of this will depend on the status of America, let's hope we're better by then, uh, but we're going to evaluate it based on the science and the data, but at minimum, I think we're going to be in exactly the same place. Thank you. Thank you. Steve? Oh, my turn. Uh, Governor or, or Dr. Levine, are, are you folks concerned about uh, nationally our, uh, our uh, politicians are sort of firing over the bow, so to speak, on, on uh, COVID and response and what's happened in the past and the vaccine, et cetera, et cetera. Are, are you worried that this is really going to undermine the, uh, the confidence that folks are going to have and thinking that this thing's actually being won? It, you know, I'll, I'll let Dr. Levine answer part of that because some of it's political. I'll answer uh, as well. I'm always concerned uh, about what's happening across the nation. Uh, but as you've seen from the very start, uh, here in Vermont, uh, we have done what we think is right. Um, we've relied on the science and the data, uh, and uh, and that has driven every decision we've made, uh, relying on uh, Dr. Levine and Dr. Kelso and the health experts uh, in, in everything that we do. Uh, and so uh, we weren't sure whether that was going to be the right approach, uh, but it's proven uh, to be effective. And uh, that's why we continue to do what we're doing, regardless of what's happening across the nation. And again, We'll take any advice, uh, we'll watch what's going on, uh, but at the end of the day, um, our team, uh, this administration, is doing what we think is, is most effective and the safest uh, um, plan forward uh, for Vermonters, and we'll continue to do so. Are you worried, Governor, about your race becoming that kind of a, a situation? Well, I, I can only uh, do what uh, what I think is right. And again, I will make decisions regardless of, of the repercussions in an election. Uh, you know, my first priority, my first job, uh, my first responsibility is as governor. And uh, and I'll continue to do what I've done from the very start. Anything to offer? Yeah, I don't have a lot more to offer. Um, I want people to realize much of this is a natural experiment. Um, and the data that was shown today, Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, and the percent positivity of the college students, that's very instructive. These are states that are doing pretty well right now, as you saw by the map. When we look at that same kind of data, at colleges that have closed, at states that have uh, not closed but reported large numbers of students or staff being positive. They're generally states that have not achieved a state of virus suppression that would make you expect that the colleges will do well. Um, and we need to all learn from each other. So as we go through this fall semester, uh, we hope we can stay where we are now um, and that things will continue to go smoothly. Um, and at the same time, we hope that other parts of the country can improve and things will go smoothly for them. But this whole uh, business about restarting anything, uh, really, as I think people have said nationwide, the virus runs the show. And it's the way we are actually managing our interaction with the virus. So if we get the virus to a level where 
it's quite manageable and very low prevalence, uh, we should be able to continue to restart things the way we have. And if other states actually have higher levels of virus, but they're restarting successfully, we need to learn from that too. Um, but it'll all be a very important comparison to make over the next few months, at least with the college enterprise, um, to see if um, things hold the way they are now. Any word on, uh, final question, but any word on numbers or anything like that from, the, uh, from here in Vermont with the K through 12s at all, or how that's going? Yeah, I think, you know, it's literally four days. Um, so, and since we're not testing everybody there, we don't have any data, um, and so we'll have to wait a little bit longer for that to, to see what ensues. But it's all going really well. <laughs> all right, I believe we have Stuart Ledbetter, WPTZ, on the phone. Good morning. Uh, strange to be on the other end. A uh, question for Dr. Levine. Um, I assume you've seen the new UVM study out this week um, that suggests, uh, among other things, that the number of confirmed cases in Chipman County may be only a fifth of the actual number of infections uh, in the county, uh, cumulatively. And do you buy that? And, and how would that affect your thinking on testing asymptomatic people? You know, this is one of the rare times I come to the microphone and I'm not familiar with the study uh, that you're reporting about. So I, I can't comment so much uh, without having seen it. But I think that there is general agreement that no matter where you are in the country, what number of cases you're talking about, that that is not the full number of cases. Uh, so whether it's the percentage you describe or not, I, I have no idea. I do subscribe quite heavily to the concept that the rate of people walking around asymptomatically with virus is higher than we realize, and that many people who would test positive uh, but are asymptomatic, that could account for 25 to 40 percent of all the people who would test positive. So it's not a stretch for me to think that we're not measuring everyone. Uh, by any means. I'm not sure if that answers everything you wanted out of there, but I, I do believe pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic transmission of disease are real, and that uh, the, the number of people who don't realize they have the virus because they feel well um, is, is substantial out there, for sure. Yeah, this is part of the UVM mask uh, study that showed it, in some cases it provides a masks provide some false sense of security. Oh, okay, that, no, that study I'm quite familiar with because uh, I'm a co-author on that. Uh, so, <laughs> but I don't think we went as far as to, to, to I, I know where you're coming from. Um, part, part of that study um, did actually talk about the fact that um, the zero prevalence rate was in the 2% range. So keep that in mind. Uh, it more or less confirmed the fact that we do believe there is a very low level of prevalence in acquaintance with the virus on the part of our population in general. Right, Al. Uh, a question for the governor, if I could follow up on the uh, U.S. Senate uh, was unable to pass anything yesterday uh, in terms of the fourth coronavirus relief package. Would you rather something, uh, as you know, the Democrats felt what the majority leader was advancing was really insufficient? Yeah, well, I mean, my preference would be uh, for them to come to agreement. Uh, it seems that they are uh, a, a long ways apart, uh, but there's always the middle, right? There's always a way for everyone uh, to give, uh, give a little bit uh, to come to some conclusion. So, um, um, it's unfortunate that they didn't uh, move forward with anything uh, at this point. I'm still uh, confident that they will come to some agreement, uh, but time, I, I just don't know when. Uh, and, uh, and it becomes, the closer we get to the election, uh, the more political it gets, and, which is unfortunate for the rest of us who are just looking and seeking relief. 
Uh, while we're talking about politics, uh, you've expressed reservations about the climate change bill. It's on its way to your desk. Is that to say you're going to veto it? Yeah, I, I uh, as you know, I sent a letter uh, to legislative leaders uh, weeks ago uh, laying out my concerns, a number of concerns, uh, putting uh, the the uh, state at financial risks, uh, uh, financial peril, I believe, uh, with uh, with some of the lawsuits uh, that are coming forward. Um, but there's some other things within the bill uh, that uh, that I have concerns about as well. It's uh, it's interesting when you when you see. I mean, the the title uh, is Global Warming Solutions Act. Uh, but when I really look at the bill, I don't I don't see any solutions in there. I see all I see is mandates. And then I see a, a board uh, being put, an unelected uh, board being put into place of 23, uh, by the way, to give guidance about where we go from here. And then in about four years, there's a 26 percent uh, reduction in carbon emissions that is expected. And if you don't meet that target, you could be sued. So I, uh, you know, we're, we're waiting for the bill. I haven't seen it yet. Um, but. Uh, but again, they didn't, uh, they didn't address any of the concerns I had, uh, nor did they provide any funding of any sort, uh, even for the administration of it. So it's, uh, it's problematic in a number of different ways. Uh, I just don't think it's good government. I think there's a better way to do it. And I think we just have to look at the, the, the uh, Lake Champlain cleanup, the water quality uh, board that we have, and what we did uh, in that respect as an example of how we get to uh, a better result for uh, reducing carbon emissions and um, and addressing climate climate change. Thank you, Peter Hirschfeld, VPR. Yeah, uh, Secretary French, I'm hoping you can give us a little debrief on your conversation with superintendents on Thursday. Um, specifically, talk about. Some of the challenges that they've relayed to you as it relates to uh, reopening during this, this first week back to school. So thanks for the question. Um, yeah, you know, just to recap, I have a conversation with superintendents every week uh, that we started as part of the emergency response. Uh, so we stay closely attached on a variety of issues. Um, my general impression and what I heard from them yesterday is that things are going as well as expected. Um, certainly. You know, so much of our planning has been focused on the logistical aspects of reopening schools, and that's where they've been putting a lot of their attention. Uh, so I think, you know, so far so good in that regard. Um, I would also say that districts, uh, many of which, as you know, have opened at hybrid uh, learning dispositions, are, you know, starting to contemplate in-person instruction, and there is some tension around labor availability to do that. Um, and districts are still working on enacting the protocols uh, that are required under the health guidance. So I think, you know, the general observation I make, things are going well. Um, certainly a lot of work still remains to uh, keep schools open, um, but I, I'm really proud of the work they're doing, and uh, I think we all should be the as Vermonters. Is, is, it, is it your understanding that there are districts that would be moving uh, to a more robust in-person program right now, but for their uh, inability to get the staff they would need to do that in the, in the buildings themselves? I don't know if I'd uh, characterize it quite that way. I know districts uh, all along, many of them who started in hybrid had planned or anticipated moving to more in-person, and that requires addressing a uh, number of issues in current, in current, including putting in the necessary protections. So staff availability is certainly one of those factors, uh, but they have several to consider. Thank you. Mike Donahue, the Islander. Good morning. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, I, was, I was wondering uh, if I understood you correctly, and I got on a couple minutes late, but there were 38 uh, positive cases uh, among the college students. I know a couple of weeks ago you gave an actual breakdown by UVM and BTC and everything. Uh, did I miss what the breakdown of where those 38 cases were? I know Middlebury College is reporting they had some, and uh, I was just wondering. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, who is that yeah, problem? Commissioner Pichek or um, Dr. Schneider, do either of you have the information? 
Governor, this is Rich Snyder. I, I don't have it by individual campus, or I'm sorry. But I will tell you that anyone that was infected is no longer infected and is out of quarantine. Uh, I understand that. Uh, thanks very much, guys. But I'm, I'm interested in where, where there were. Were 30 of the 38 at the UVM, or are they spread all across Vermont, or uh, you know, where were they? And, and who has those numbers? That, and I realize yeah. you may not, but uh, let me. Yeah. Or or somebody would have the breakdown. Commissioner Pichek may be able to answer some of this. Hi, Mike. Thanks for your question. So the only uh, breakdown that we provided previously was to um, talk about uh, colleges in the Burlington area, since there's a high concentration of students there. So we included in that UVM, Champlain, and St. Michael's. Um, to, you know, we've been keeping them in the aggregate just to not call out any specific institution, particularly if there's only a single case at a small institution. But I can tell you from the data that um, there are no colleges that stand out as having, uh, you know, a lot of cases compared to how many students they have returning. Um, there's some that have no cases. There's some that have just a very small handful. But there's there are no colleges that stand out um, in terms of having you know, more cases than you would anticipate based on their student enrollment. Well, two weeks ago, there was a breakdown that included Vermont Tech and Randolph, and that's, that's a count with only one college. So obviously the administration has provided those numbers in the past, looking for them today. So we can uh, provide those to you, uh, Mike, you know, by email, but we do have all of the individual institutions. We've just been providing them in the aggregate. I understand you've been providing them in the aggregate, but you did provide them individually two weeks ago. We'd like to continue that tradition of transparency. No, we certainly want to be transparent as well, Mike, but maybe, maybe we provided information about a single college, but we certainly didn't provide information about every college, um, you know, to date. But. Uh, certainly, we want to be transparent. That's why we're we're trying to make sure we provide those those numbers throughout the restart and on an ongoing basis throughout the semester. So, we'll uh, certainly work to get you that. Well, I appreciate that because there were three colleges that were mentioned. I think it was UVM. I think it was Castleton might have been the third one, but Vermont Tech uh, was one of them. So, Castleton being a, a, a lone institution also. And we did so mention North. Appreciate Berlin. And we did mention Northern Vermont University, if you remember, two weeks ago, because they had zero cases, so it was easy to talk about them. Um, so we did call out Northern Vermont University, you know, to give a comparison a couple of weeks ago. All right, Mike, we can. Take Let's a look hear at who has. It'd be great to have zero. You know, if there's other institutions that had zero, let hear the positives of those institutions too. You know. All right, we can we can look into this further for you, Mike. Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Greg, the county courier. Hi, Governor. Uh, happy Friday. Um, I, I guess I'm going to ask for a follow-up from Secretary Schilling. Uh, last, earlier in the week, you mentioned that you know, state police has, for quite a while, had, a, had trouble with recruitment and retention. Um, I'm wondering what you've done uh, with our high employment, unemployment numbers to uh, reach out to potential uh, prospects uh, to lead them towards a relatively uh, recession-proof career in law enforcement. Yeah, I think what I mentioned, uh, just to be clear, uh, what I mentioned was pre-pandemic, uh, we had a labor shortage across every sector. Uh, I don't want to just single out uh, one sector. I mean, every single sector uh, had uh, had challenges in terms of recruitment. So, uh, in fact, we had more jobs open uh, than we had un unemployed people. Obviously, uh, that's not the case uh, today. Uh, but of the uh, forty thousand, uh, of the, or less, a few less than forty thousand at this point in time, who are unemployed, uh, and um, I'm not sure that. I mean, I think I believe most of them are looking forward to going back uh, to their their normal uh, professions, um, and we continue to recruit. I think we've uh, we have a, a fairly robust uh, recruiting mechanism, 
and uh, and had been making some strides in, in trying to uh, recruit more uh, for law enforcement. So, uh, Commissioner Sherling, is there anything you want to add to that? I mean, we're looking uh, past the pandemic, and uh, and obviously uh, we want to get the uh, the best. And uh, we thought we uh, we had a good program established to do just that. I think that's right, Governor. Um, the the Office of uh, Professional Development at the State Police uh, has a, a robust recruitment uh, set of strategies. Um, just in the last uh, year or so, deployed uh, a much wider array of uh, social media strategy and outreach, um, and you know, at, we're casting the net as far and wide as possible, uh, not just for um, uh, Vermonters, but beyond that. Also, this is part and parcel of our efforts to diversify the workforce um, and get people from uh, as many varied backgrounds, races, cultures, uh, et cetera, as possible. Um, so it's an, it's an ongoing effort. And if you want specific details, uh, I'm happy to connect you with our public information officer in the Office of uh, Professional Development. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thanks for that update. Um, moving on to my question for today, uh, and it, again, I think this might be for you, Secretary Schilling. Uh, a reader reached out uh, after reading about Lieutenant Governor David Zuckerman's fundraiser, um, where he was raffling off ice cream uh, for anyone who donated to his campaign. The reader believes that this is a violation of the state's gambling law, uh, as raffles are only uh, legal for bona fide nonprofits that are tax exempt. Um, would you be able to shed some light on if this is really a, a violation to the state's gambling law? Uh, and to your knowledge, has anyone else expressed concerns that this may be a violation of the state statutes? It's the first I've heard of it, and I am certainly unqualified to speak on the state's gambling laws. I have not read them in probably two decades. It's just not a common thing. Uh, probably a question best suited for uh, the Attorney General's office, I would think. Okay, we can certainly go there. Uh, Governor, do you have anything you want to say to that? Or maybe Secretary Young, I, I don't know if uh, she has anything to say. I think they, I think her agency operates the gambling sector of Vermont. Yeah, I, I don't, um, I don't think we have anything at this point. First, I've, I've heard of this as well. So, um, maybe Secretary of State even uh, might have some, uh, some thoughts on this, but uh, nothing from our end. Okay, thank you. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Cat WCAX. Hi, this question is mostly for Dr. Levine. I'm looking at a message from a superintendent in Stowe that warned parents about a low risk COVID situation at a Stowe school. And I wanted to know on the broader scale, how are you reassuring parents when these incidents are inevitably gonna crop up that it's safe to keep schools open? Yeah, that's a great question, Kat. And we should um, distill it down a little to um, the fact that every situation is going to be unique. Um, one message we tried to give very clearly early on in this is that a case in a school is not the end of the world. In fact, you know, we have told everyone in the state that every sector we reopen means more opportunities for more people to be closer together than they have been so we anticipate increases in numbers of cases. So first thing I would say is, you know, one case in a school uh, does not mean uh, the entire school goes home to remote learning, never to return. Um, it, it's a very individualized situation, but there are many opportunities to, once you go through the interviewing and contact tracing process, um, and depending on the nature of the situation, uh, it could be one person goes home because they are the case and uh, no one else. It could mean uh, a classroom. It could mean a school. But 
It's very, very unique uh, to the situation. And most often than not, uh, the rigor that we apply with our contact tracing efforts uh, tells us very quickly. And I think, you know, people are generally surprised by that, not just in the school setting, but if they encounter somebody who was positive uh, and they end up going into the same store or they end up going to the same uh, restaurant or what have you. Um, I think there's some myths to dispel. Um, you know, we are always talking about having a substantial amount of contact within a closed space with an individual. And often people don't make that grade, if you will, so that their risk is actually quite low, even though their perception of their risk was quite high. So we do a lot more reassuring, uh, but not false reassuring, reassuring based on what we know about the transmission of the virus and what we know about that individual's particular circumstances uh, with regard to a positive case. So that's what I would do with the, the superintendent and the school as well. Um, you know, we encourage, not only encourage, we, we will always do the contact tracing for every case in Vermont. And we want to make sure that people rely on the expertise of trained professionals to do that so that they, they aren't falsely reassuring somebody or perhaps falsely getting them very, very concerned about a situation that actually can go quite well. So I hope I've answered your question. Yeah, and as a follow-up to that, have you done contact tracing at any cases stemming from a school thus far? No, I'm not aware of uh, any school that we have done that, and we talk about our cases literally every day. Um, so maybe I will learn about one today, but um, that's not been on our radar at this point. Uh, aside from the colleges, where any of the cases at the colleges, uh, we're quite aware of what's gone on there. And even at the colleges, I might add, what's, what's that? I said, I'm definitely talking about K through 12 at the moment. I, I heard yeah. all the college, um, you know, from stuff earlier on. Yeah, so I'm not aware of a K through 12 yet, but uh, certainly be able to report on that if uh, one has come up. Sure, and last question I have on this, on this vein is, clarify how you will let the public know about cases that crop up in school. Yeah, I'm gonna ask for Secretary French's uh, input on that one because we've uh, been having a lot of uh, discussions internally and meetings about that with our teams. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Lee. Yeah, Jack, the um, couple approaches, one is certainly the reporting that will occur on the website. Um, we're in the process of finalizing how we're going to uh, do the data suppression for that. Um, we're gonna meet on that early next week. I think the other approach is uh, the consistent uh, materials that we prepared from a communications perspective with the Department of Health. Uh, the districts will have the ability to uh, present that material to parents and so forth uh, as the issues are. Thank you. Lisa, the Associated Press. <clears throat> Uh, thank you. Um, Governor, you mentioned earlier in the call when answering your question about turning the spigot a little bit more um, soon if the, you know, virus cases remain low in Vermont. Um, what, maybe I missed something, but what, were you referring to a certain sector in the economy? Yeah, or, uh, um, I you know, didn't. What would the next step be? Yeah, I didn't mention it uh, okay. today, but I did on, uh, on Tuesday, I believe. You know, we'd be focusing on the hospitality sector. It's the one that has been uh, the greatestly uh, greatest uh, affected, uh, uh, greatly affected uh, in uh, in terms of the entire pandemic and and most at risk uh, at this point in time. So um, we'd be focusing on in that area. Um, and so, would it be like expanding um, lodging capacity or anything like that? Yeah, ex ex exactly. Anything okay. we can do uh, to help uh, with hospitality as long as it's safe and the numbers warrant that. So again, we'll be taking a look this week and uh, if everything uh, continues to improve, uh, those are the areas that we'd be looking at. Is that something you're hoping to do before foliage season? Yes. Okay, thank you. 
Ingrid, the Valley Reporter. Uh, hello, Governor. K through 12 schools are obviously operating very differently now. The changes are all very district to district, but some are constant, like uh, are consistent, like mandatory masks and hybrid learning. Is there research being conducted at the state level about the effects that these changes could have on students? Um, yeah, that would be a Secretary French question. I, again, um, just want to be clear, you know, we put forth uh, guidance uh, for a, a common set of uh, principles, operating uh, principles uh, for schools. Uh, and then at that point, uh, they were uh, able to do um, what they thought was right for their communities and, and for the parents and school, uh, the teachers and, and students as well. Uh, in terms of whether it would be hybrid uh, or uh, in-person instruction or uh, total remote. So they had choices in that regard, uh, but we, uh, we put forth uh, the guidance in terms of masks and, and so forth. Uh, Secretary French, uh, can you answer that? Yeah, thank you, Governor. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't say research per se, uh, but we are going to be initiating a monthly data collection that will allow us to identify the patterns of uh, learning opportunities that are occurring in our schools. And I think we'll use that at a couple levels. One is to contemplate perhaps further regulation that might be necessary or further guidance that might be necessary uh, to ensure the quality of uh, standards are being achieved. I think just more importantly, this issue of beginning to assess the impact of the emergency on student learning and uh, that's going to be an ongoing task uh, for, for many months, but um, we need to be in that sort of initial work of figuring out the impact, and uh, that's one of the, the key goals of getting school reopened so we can begin to do some of that assessment. I wouldn't qualify that necessarily as research, but it's certainly a practical level uh, designed to address the specific learning needs of students as a result of the emergency. And, and again, I might uh, I might add as well, um, as we've heard from our health experts, uh, pediatricians and, and others, uh, we know that in-person instruction is best for our kids. Uh, so that's our mission, that's our goal. And uh, the more information we can share, the more uh, we can prove in terms of the safety aspect, uh, the better off we'll be. So we'll want to uh, share uh, the results. Um, and then both, again, both positive and negative uh, so that we learn from it and uh, with safety in mind, but also uh, what's best for our kids. Thank you. Jolie, Local 22. I know you touched on this briefly, but I'm wondering how exactly you'll determine um, when it's safe or appropriate to bring a COVID vaccine to Vermont, and then what will that process look like um, moving forward once the vaccine is here? Uh, yeah, Commissioner Levine, I know there's been a, uh, um, he'll be coming up to answer that uh, in a minute, but um, we've had a task force uh, that's been meeting for weeks to contemplate uh, this very area. And uh, as well, the CDC and FDA and others uh, will be providing guidance as well. So we feel as though we're in a good position. Uh, we've, uh, we've contemplated uh, how uh, we might uh, be able to roll this out uh, and they've been meeting again on this for weeks. Dr. Levine. Thank you, Governor. Yeah, we've been meeting on this for weeks. There are abundant aspects of this that need to be ironed out in terms of simple logistical aspects like managing a whole uh, supply stockpile of vaccine, administering it with the appropriate syringes and needles, having the appropriate IT system set up, having the appropriate communication system set up so that uh, the public can access this vaccine, having the healthcare system set up in a way that uh, expeditiously can deliver this. But I have to go back a step here and let you know that it won't be a, the state of Vermont's decision to negotiate with a certain drug company and get the vaccine when we want to get it. This is going to be a much more of a national strategy and vaccine will then be uh, distributed across the states and there will have to be mechanisms at that level that really make this an equitable process, get it to the people who need it the most first, no matter what state they happen to live in, and uh, then 
scale up the operation of manufacture to the point where large populations can get it. So as, a, as my uh, epidemiologist colleague has told me num numerous times, based on experience with H1N1 and other uh, uh, public health issues, the vaccine will come to us in ways that um, may not always make sense right away, um, but they'll be part of a national strategy. We may not get hundreds of thousands of doses of vaccine on a given day, we may get hundreds of doses of vaccines on a given day, hopefully thousands. Um, some of that will be predictable, some of that will be unpredictable. Um, and we'll have to realize that, you know, there are a minimum of nine trials going on right now of vaccines. How many of those will be successful? How will the right ones be chosen? Um, how will you know that you're getting the one that actually has the best safety profile and the best efficacy profile, et cetera. Um, we're going to be reliant on the scientists and we're gonna be reliant on the manufacturers and the studies and the way those studies are critically appraised and then the government's ability to distribute it to the population. So I don't wanna make it sound Rocket science complex, but it is going to be complex. It's not going to be a very simple thing of, oh, we got a vaccine, let's just give it to everybody tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Andrew, Caledonia Record. Uh, yes, good afternoon, uh, Governor. I'm wondering, can you share your thoughts on the uh, House budget um, that's passed, that presumably passing out today, and specifically if you support the $23.8 million in bridge funding for the state college system? Sure, uh, Andrew. And I might, uh, this may be a, a bit of a long, uh, longer answer uh, than uh, normal, but I, I just think that uh, there are some uh, folks, when they hear, uh, they see the headlines that the, the House has passed the budget that all of a sudden it's automatically heading uh, to my desk for signature. And I just want to just go through the process just a little bit for those who just aren't aware. Um, this, uh, the budget framework is something that we present uh, our version to the House. It always originates in the House of Representatives. Uh, the Appropriations Committee uh, does their work and makes some changes and alterations and so forth uh, over weeks, which they've done. Uh, they bring it to the House floor for a vote of the uh, entire 150 member uh, House of Representatives. Uh, and then they, uh, they take a vote, uh, which they did. Uh, there's, there's two readings of that, first reading and a second reading. So they took their first reading and it passed uh, the House, their version passed the House yesterday. Uh, they'll take a second, re uh, uh, there'll be a third reading today. Uh, so they'll have to vote again uh, today. At that point, uh, that uh, their version of the bill gets sent to the Senate and it starts all over again. So the Senate Appropriations Committee will do their work, make any alterations and then go through uh, the Senate process before the 30 members of the Senate uh, and take two votes on uh, subsequent days on that. So then at that point, uh, they send it back to the House and see if they agree and if they do, it gets sent to me. If they don't, uh, they have either a conference committee or, or all kinds of things. So my, the, the bottom line is it's got a ways to go. So it's not as though it's ready to come here. The version uh, that I've seen uh, from the House uh, thus far uh, is fairly close uh, to ours. So I'm, uh, uh, I'm uh, uh, grateful for that and their work. Um, there's some things that we didn't get that I wanted, um, but, uh, but there are things that uh, they went along with that I wanted as well. So that's the way the budget process works. In terms of the uh, bridge funding uh, for uh, the state colleges, as you might recall, um, I put in a provision in our budget uh, for $30 million to, for uh, the use of uh, um, uh, federal funds from the relief funds uh, to be utilized for that purpose if we were able to get flexibility uh, from uh, Congress. Um, the, the House actually did the same thing. They utilized that uh, relief funding that, uh, that I had uh, suggested uh, but uh, because they didn't, uh, we didn't, it didn't meet the guidelines of, of Congress, they went at it a bit of a different way and they leveraged money out of uh, public safety. They spent money in public safety with, uh, with uh, Corona relief funds 
uh, and which freed up uh, dollars uh, to, to use for bridge funding. So it's the same pot of money uh, in the end. Uh, we, uh, we just went about it in different ways. They, they were creative and I'm, um, you know, tip of the hat to them. I think that uh, that worked out just fine because uh, in the, uh, the guidance that were given from Congress, uh, this was appropriate. So we can use that money uh, for uh, some of the, the wages and so forth, salaries within public safety to free up that general fund dollar uh, that we need uh, to give to the state colleges. So again, uh, I, give, uh, I give them great credit for being creative. Uh, that's what we all need to do. Uh, but, um, but it's the same pot of money in the end because they utilize uh, that uh, Corona or, uh, relief fund money uh, for this purpose in, in a long about way. Thank you for that. Um, and if I may have Dr. Levine, uh, as quickly as the fact, uh, is there anything of note uh, yeah, up in Orleans County? I um, see in the UK account there were a single day with four cases and a total of seven in the last week, um, which isn't a big number all told, but as far as the Northeast Kingdom goes, it's significant. No, very, very astute observation. Uh, the question has been asked. Um, and um, at the moment, uh, through the contact tracing team, we know of no specific relationships or uh, events of concern, um, but we're asking the same questions ourselves and we'll be discussing it later this afternoon at our daily meeting. But nothing really, uh, nothing I'm hiding, but nothing that uh, we're aware of at this point in time. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, if you'll uh, allow me, uh, for Secretary French, you mentioned the task force report that I thought uh, was to be released this week. Has that come out yet? Yeah, uh, you mentioned it on Tuesday. Yeah, thank you for asking. It's coming out this afternoon, actually. Okay, thank you. That's it for me. Have a good day. Thank you. Aaron, VT Digger. Can you hear me? We can. Yeah. Um, we've heard from a couple of families that wanted to enroll in all online learning that they've been told there's no more room for their children. Um, Secretary French, are you confident that districts have said they would offer fully remote schooling to families will be able to meet the demand? Hi. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, I believe uh, it pertains to access to the Vermont Virtual Learning Cooperative. Uh, and yes, we've had a bit of a log jam there, uh, largely due to a lot of last minute requests uh, for slots in the system, and we're working through those as quickly as we can. So I think, you know, in terms of that system, I am confident that we'll be able to meet the need, uh, but we are dealing with sort of a lot of last minute enrollments. Uh, districts also have other opportunities and other systems they can use. So uh, I, think, I think districts will be in a pretty good place in terms of resources. And uh, how are you planning to specifically deal with the fast log? Like, are there plans in place to like expand the number of plots somehow? Yes, we have the ability to do that. Uh, once again, there was a large number of requests that came in at the very last minute, right before the start of school. So we're dealing with sort of a backlog there. Uh, but we have the ability to scale uh, that system with the Vermont Virtual Learning Cooperative. Hmm. So it's kind of like a question of how many automatically are in the system and you just need to up that number? Yeah, we also have to provision uh, staff and so forth. Uh, you know, what happened is we had a large number of requests come in at the last minute. We also, um, that entity contracts with school districts for a certain number of slots and we had districts exceeding their contracted numbers at the last minute as well. So it, it created a bit of a log jam, but we are working through it. Okay, thank you. Um, I also have a quick Hopefully, a quick follow-up question for Levine about that um, UVM study. Um, well, more it's, it's preprint and it's technically a study. Um, I uh, I noticed that you know the sample size was based on a self-response rate from you know people being mailed just a request for something and then returning it. Um, and then, you know, about 600 people were interviewed and maybe 2% of them had the serum come back positive. That seems like a pretty small sample size to me. Uh, you know, 2% of 600 is like 10 people. Do you think that that's like a fairly accurate number of actual like percentage of people who have 
um, antibodies across Chittenden County, or is it more just kind of like a rough estimate for the purpose of the study? <clears throat> Well, it, we can't use the word rough estimate because it is the actual number that came out of the study. But in terms of is that a, is that a good approximation of what's really going on in the county, um, the, the, the discussion part of the paper does get into the fact that these are a little bit more selected people because they're people who've had contact with the UVM Health Network as opposed to people who haven't. Um, but it is in the county, you're right. It does make sense if you give it the common sense test. You know, we've always felt, we've been saying this for months now, that there's probably just a few percent of people in Vermont that have had some kind of experience with the virus, um, and certainly nothing that would approximate herd immunity, um, but um, nothing that gets as large as parts of New York City that might be 20% because they had such a major uh, problem with the virus in select parts of the city, uh, but more consistent with a lot of other places in the Northeast where we just don't see such high rates. So I think yeah. it is a good approximation of what um, is probably really going on um, with all the caveats that go with using serology testing in a low prevalence population. Thank you. Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Governor. I wanted to go back to the, the House budget for a minute here. Uh, when I was looking through the detail of the economic recovery fund, it looks uh, like they followed what you were asking. They're putting about $175 million, as, as I read it, um, to the ACCD and the tax department for economic relief. And uh, giving, it looks like giving the administration pretty broad parameters. Now, obviously, the Senate um, could put some stricter requirements on that, but I, I just wanted to get your, your opinion of, of that piece of it, the economic recovery. Yeah, uh, in terms of the economic uh, recovery portion of the bill, um, I believe, uh, and I can get you the, the facts uh, as we know them, uh, it appears in this version, uh, the House version, uh, that they actually shorted uh, economic relief by about 33 million, I believe, somewhere between 33 and, and 50 million. Um, did, Governor, did you have a question? Oh, I'm no, sorry. I, wait, uh, maybe I have. Oh, uh, I think I was saying, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry to interrupt. Uh, thank you, Governor. Thank you, Tim. Uh, the, the governor is right. Our our review of the bill shows that the governor. Um, had asked for 133 million in economic recovery grants for ACCD, um, and what is in the bill is about 100,000, um, 100 million of that. So you know we can compare notes later, but that's that's how we're reading the bill. Just, would would you know where that that extra 30 million or so went? Well, there are some extra um, appropriations that we did not request from the uh, um, in our budget, and maybe you're reading in there some of the um, up there was an appropriation to UVM to the independent colleges, um, you know, a, a number of appropriations that uh, went to um, other entities, not ACCD. If you're counting those as economic um, recovery grants, uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, there was quite a bit to uh, higher education and uh, K-12 as well, uh, I believe. So that uh, that could yeah, that's that could be uh, the, the the largest portion of that. Okay, so so um, all right, I'll I'll just uh, go with, with the uh, information I have there. And then, Suzanne, if, if you have a email, you can send me the, the details. That'd be great. Yeah, I think we can send you a comparison of the, the, the request from the governor and the request um, and, the, and what the House put in the bill. All right, great, thank you. But, but again, Tim, I just want to, to make sure everyone understands it uh, still has a long ways to go, still has to go to the, uh, it's, it still has to be passed by the, the House. I think they're planning to try and do that today, uh, then get sent to the Senate uh, for their work. So it could change drastically uh, by the time it gets back and then they have to agree before it gets sent to me. So. It's uh, it's weeks away. It, it, 
but they do have to hurry a little bit and have to be approved. I agree. Yeah. Agree. Great, thanks. Avery, WCAX. My question is for Secretary French. We're hearing a wide variety of stories from schools, some offering AP classes, some aren't offering them, some are offering some of them. Has the state released any guidelines for AP offerings, and are students getting shortchanged for their education if they aren't getting the class, these classes at all? Yeah, I haven't heard that specific concern. I've had some concerns up forward about um, scheduling the AP exams, and that's something I'm working on on behalf uh, of those uh, concerns. Uh, we do have very close relationships with the College Board and the AP, uh, ACC company as well. Um, so we're able to uh, sort of figure these things out to a certain extent. But right now, I think the, what I've heard is the bigger concern is trying to figure out the scheduling of the exams. Um, and that's where I can follow up on the other concern as well with the companies. If one school isn't offering an AP class, is there an option for a student to potentially get that class somewhere else? Yeah, certainly, uh, as I mentioned in the same uh, press conference, our BTVLC, the Vermont Virtual Learning Cooperative, um, we have that capacity there as well. And there's a number of ways students can access the materials uh, and work through remote learning online. Thank you. Joe, Barton Chronicle. Hello, I believe this is for Dr. Levine. Uh, I'd like to get back to Orleans County, and I just wanted to be clear in my own mind. Um, the tracking and tracing people have completed their work, um, speaking with the um, people who are uh, testing positive for COVID in um, Orleans County. Is that true? That should be true. You know, we have uh, a mid 90s percent rate of connecting with p people who are positive within 24 hours. I, I should, um, yeah. No, no, please finish. No, I, I should emphasize that it, it is not, un though this seems unusual with the number of cases in Orleans County, it's not unusual for us from time to time to see phenomena like this that we really can't explain. Um, and um, it's just almost serendipitous when that happens. But obviously it pikes our interest, and that's why we're uh, making sure that when we talk about it later today, everybody's covered all the bases and there's no common theme. Sarah, at this point, it doesn't appear to be a common theme, and um, given you know, prior experience in other places, it may work out um, that you never know uh, why this happened. It's just one of those things that can happen. Exactly. And, and now we have a lot of experience with that because th this is not the only county where this has happened, where we thought maybe we were onto something, but then we weren't, and then it fizzled out, and that was the end of it. So this has happened a number of times over the months we've been uh, involved in this pandemic with a variety of counties in Vermont. Would you expect to have any more information uh, or a better set, uh, uh, more certainty about um, it being just uh, a one-off event uh, by Tuesday? Oh, absolutely. We'll also have um, three more testing days, four more testing days, so we can actually see if there are continuing to be cases from there. But yeah, for sure. Great, thank you very much. Guy Page. Good morning, this is a question for Secretary French. Uh, my second one will be for, I believe, Secretary Curley. Uh, news reports show that school racial equity task forces have been culling racist books from school libraries. Is there a record of these removed books? Uh, and if so, uh, is it available to the public or will it be? 
Yeah, I'm unaware of that activity, and I'm unaware if, there's, if such lists are being maintained. We certainly don't have um, those lists at the state level. Okay, perhaps a good question for uh, for Susanna Davis. Um, thank you, uh, Secretary or uh, Governor Scott or Secretary Curley. Uh, Vermont has the second lowest housing occupancy rate in the nation. Uh, I'm sorry, housing vacancy rate in the nation. And we also have a substantial number of so-called zombie homes that are stuck in foreclosure and therefore cannot be occupied and for, for lengthy periods. Can you tell us uh, more or less how many zombie homes Vermont has and is there any state strategy for reducing this number of zombie homes and the average length of time that they remain vacant? I'm not aware of how many zombies we have in the state uh, or their homes, but we can certainly uh, get that information uh, for you. I think uh, Commissioner Hanford probably would be able to provide that information. I'm not sure he's on. Uh, Secretary Curley, do you know offhand? He, uh, Commissioner Hanford is not on the line. I wish he were because I'm, I'm sure he could probably uh, answer this right off the top of his head. But I am unfamiliar with uh, how many zombie homes that you refer to are in foreclosure and the length of time that they are in that state. So we are happy to get back to you on that. Um, I will connect you with Commissioner Hanford. Thank you. Thank you. Mike, the Essex Thank reporter. You. Mike, the Essex reporter. Star six. Hi, thanks everyone. We hear you. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, Governor, sorry if I missed something recent out of your office about this, but we have a good amount of readers who have been asking about anthrax service in the Vermonter. Uh, are you able to share what criteria you're using to select a restart date for Vermont anthrax services? And can you offer a hope for target to the redundancy of those services? Yeah, um, you know we're uh, continuing uh, to talk with uh, with Amtrak. Um, obviously, uh, we want to get that going just as quick as we can when it's safe. Uh, as we've seen uh, throughout uh, the state, public transportation is down um, by at least 50% at this point in time. Uh, the ridership of uh, Amtrak, uh, I believe, is way down as well. Uh, but uh, but I've heard uh, that there's some. Uh, some news uh, they want to start uh, to, to coming back to Rutland first uh, maybe in the next, in the coming weeks and uh, we are uh, engaged with them uh, to do uh, whatever we can uh, to uh, to provide for the service into Vermont when it's safe um, but we'll be working with the uh, agency of transportation uh, as well as with the Department of Health uh, to make sure that we have provisions in place uh, when when we do uh, I have a uh, have a uh, Amtrak running again, but uh, I would say uh, in the next uh, at least in the next two or three months uh, we'll see uh, see Amtrak running again in the state. Great, thank you, Colin. Seven days. Hi, this question is for um, Secretary Smith. I'm hoping we can just get an update on the child care hubs and, um, and, and what you're hearing about those. Are you hearing any issues or has the rollout been smooth? Thanks, Colin. I was hoping I was going to get through the press conference without a question. <laughs> um, the uh, child care hubs, uh, it, there's been a remarkable job here. I just want to um, uh, congratulate both uh, Vermont After School and DCF as they continue their work and what they've done. Um, just to give you an update on the report, there are 18 school age child care hubs have been confirmed and will provide child care at 64 different locations. In the aggregate, uh, the hubs can serve approximately 3,780 children. With many of those children uh, attending more than one day a week. Uh, we're starting to get the number now of children. Re as you remember, I've been talking about slots, but slots are um, 
are what we have made available. Now, now we're starting to get uh, those slots filled and we'll be able to sort of uh, transition to child the number of children we're serving. And, and just remember, uh, a slot can be occupied by one child multiple days or multiple children on multiple days. So we're starting to get that um, interested. As we look into the next few weeks, um, we've identified 30 hubs with 85 different locations. Uh, of the total identified that I've mentioned so, right uh, so far today, 41 locations are currently up and running and accepting children. The remainder, like I said, will be coming on in the, the, the in next week or the week after, and that's because of the school schedule, that's because of getting uh, these hubs up and running. If you think about this, um, all said and done, we should be uh, close to um, when when we sort of get this together, about 6,000 children uh, that we'll, we will be serving uh, over the next uh, over the next few weeks, and that's a remarkable uh, effort. We will be sort of now changing our strategy of of strategically looking out through the state um, to see where there are gaps and waiting, not waiting, but reaching out uh, to those areas where there may be gaps, and we may see strategically these numbers start to be a little bit smaller in terms of moving forward because the hubs may be smaller. And again, just to mention, when I say hubs, um, we've sort of evolved in our thinking here. When we used to say hubs, we meant one location. Um, now when we say hubs, it's a hub probably with multiple locations. For example, in Essex, over 10 locations. I can't remember specifically. So that's where we are right now. The work on the project continues. Um, and again, uh, thank you for asking about this question because we're paying particularly, particular attention to those areas of the state where there, we need additional childcare um, services, particularly in sort of the southern uh, Bennington, Wyndham County uh, area that we had mentioned last week, and, and certainly a couple in, in, uh, um, in uh, central Vermont as well. But um, a lot of progress has been made. I want to thank, for all, thank uh, uh, Vermont After School and DCF for all their efforts, including working through the Labor Day weekend to get up to get this uh, temporary program up and running. If this, just so that everybody knows, if the schools start to transition to five days a week throughout the state, we will start um, demobilizing uh, these, these, uh, these child care hub programs. Uh, but we'll, we'll, see, we'll see that in the next few weeks of where we're going and the need and where we're going. Have you heard? I mean, have you heard any issues with the ones that are up and running, or are there any stumbling blocks that you're working through right now, or how would you see the rollout today? I think today, I'm, you know, for what we've done in a very, very short amount of time, I, I'm pretty happy with the rollout. Uh, you know, as we move forward, we've had some. You know, we're always looking for staffing um, as we move forward. Uh, and, and when I talk about staffing, I just want to be clear, you know, we could have a hub that's looking for staffing, but they're looking for staffing at a particular location. All the rest of the locations could have the appropriate uh, staffing and, and up and running. So I think, um, you know, if I'm looking at it um, overall, uh, this has been a remarkable effort that I just, um, I, I can't, uh, stress enough how much people have worked um, tremendously to bring this system up and running. Thanks. And then one other thing, Governor, I was here on Tuesday, but I believe you were asked about the lawsuit that's been brought um, um, regarding Secretary Condos' plan to um, mail ballots to voters. And I just wanted to give you another chance to revisit that now that you've had a few days to digest. It, um, do you agree with the lawsuit? Do you have any? Do you share it? Any of the concerns you know, um, it, that are brought by yeah. members of your party? 
Yeah, no, thank you very much. I don't think it was brought by the, the party. I think they just happen to be Republicans. But um, I just want to say, uh, first of all, uh, I, I believe uh, the mail-in ballots uh, is a safe provision in Vermont. I think we've proved that. Um, but there are some elements of their lawsuit um, that uh, will be interesting uh, to see uh, the results of. I, um, I've had concerns uh, about the uh, third party uh, who was able to uh, recover ballots and bring them in. Um, and, and that's been, I think, I think that's a problematic area. Um, so we'll see what happens. But uh, again, from my standpoint, I, th I thought they did a tremendous job uh, with the, the primary, uh, the, the record number of ballots uh, that were mailed. And, uh, and it appeared without too many issues. Um, so um, I believe that, um, you know, during this pandemic, uh, we want to make sure that people have the ability, uh, the opportunity to vote, and uh, this will provide for it. But we'll see how the, uh, the uh, lawsuit progresses, but I'll, we'll be watching. Are you, are you comfortable moving forward with the plan? Any ballots are expected to start going out within the next 10 days or so? Well, I don't, I don't have a voice in that, uh, as you might recall. Uh, the legislature uh, took me out of the equation, so this is uh, this is all in the hands of Secretary Condos. Thank you very much. April Burlington Free Press. Hi, I'm not sure to whom to direct this question, but it is about trick or treating. And I'm just wondering, can we expect any guidance from the state as to whether trick-or-treating will be permissible or recommended, or will towns make that determination? We heard this week that the city of Los Angeles has canceled trick-or-treating and Halloween events. I'm just curious if there's been any discussion on yeah. that regard. Yeah, no, it's appropriate to have the conversation now. Uh, Commissioner Levine. <coughs> must have been reading my mind because we brought this conversation up earlier this week um, because we do need to take it seriously um, and again I would compare the state of Vermont to Los Angeles on just the one metric that's important which is the percent positivity rate and the amount of new cases um, so there should and there should, in appropriate locations, be some public health guidance or even um, public health recommendations regarding having or not having Halloween. I, I don't see that as a problem in Vermont now, but I do see it as an opportunity for everybody to be creative and to think about how to do things correctly. Um, obviously, one thing Los Angeles said was you know, not having big parties and big gatherings of people for Halloween, like so often happens. Um, and it can be very convenient to have a whole bunch of kids together in a location and celebrate Halloween without even having them have to go to house to house. Um, so obviously we need to abide by all of the mass gathering guidance that we've provided thus far uh, in Vermont. We need to think creatively uh, often there's a congregation of kids uh, on a doorstop, doorstep or uh, uh, in a porch or whatever. Um, that's probably not the way it should go this year. There are obviously going to be people who are homeowners who feel like they don't want to be in close contact with kids coming up to their house and handing them a piece of candy or handing them a basket and saying, take out the candy you want, what have you. Um, and they want to be protected. We have to abide by the six foot rule. We have to abide by the masking rule, but there are creative ways to do this, whether it be setting out the candy on a table and letting people know how much they can take and what have you, still being able to see them all be dressed up uh, as they come, having parents make sure that um, if they're accompanying their kids, or guiding their kids that they are not going to be in groups of 25 kids together, um, but it'll be a much different experience this year. So I think, you know, without giving you every detail of I, how I envision Halloween, 
Um, I try to drive home the message that within the usual guidance we give about everything, there should be room for Halloween. And uh, people can still enjoy the holiday to a degree and uh, still be festive and see everybody dressed up as they always are. Um, and I don't want to create too much of a joke here, but everyone must, must wear a mask. <laughs> Nice. Thank you. As well, April, I just, uh, I believe the parade uh, that's been, the Halloween parade in Rutland, I, I think has been postponed as well or canceled for this year, which is uh, the largest uh, parade if, for those who haven't seen it uh, should at some point, but it's the biggest parade I've ever been in and I've been to it multiple years, but so it's unfortunate, uh, but necessary uh, for them to take that action. We might also be able to collect some data on the uh, zombie homes if we uh, have Halloween. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you. That's all the questions. Okay. Oh, well, that ends the uh, questions. Uh, I might uh, add, if you can take a moment to, uh, to reflect on those we lost as a result of the actions taken 19 years ago today and those uh, family members they left behind but also about how proud it was uh, a time for us in the aftermath, how proud we were as Americans. And uh, if we could just get a, a little bit of that back uh, at this point in time, we'd all be better off. On uh, Tuesday, I uh, just want to also mention, uh, for those of you uh, who are still tuned in, uh, we're going to have a special guest on Tuesday. I'm excited about uh, the guest. We're not ready to release the name yet, just in case something happens over the next couple of days. but. Uh, we should have a, uh, we'll be able to uh, talk about that uh, maybe Monday, Monday night. So uh, stay tuned, uh, but uh, it should be a, an interesting program. Thank you very much.